Long. Let me tell you something about Littlefoot. She is a lady. She is a lady. Uh, we know that from uh, the anatomy of her pelvis, but also of the uh, area of the face, uh, the dentition, uh, the canine, and the size of teeth are smaller than those of males that we have of this species, Australopithecus prometheus. Um, in stature, she was probably about 1 meter 30 high. Uh, we can't tell the exact stature uh, until we've done more work on the vertebrae. Notice that some vertebrae are missing, and I should point out that there are one or two elements that are still missing, and we think those were washed down to a lower level in the cave. There's still a lot of breccia to excavate there, and we hope to do this in the near future. Um, now, as has been said, she is the most complete Australopithecus skeleton ever discovered from anywhere. And she is the oldest Australopithecus, the oldest hominid in southern Africa. There are older specimens in East Africa, but they are fragmentary, uh, and they are of different species. But what is important about Littlefoot is that for the first time in any early hominid, uh, any early Australopithecus, we can determine the length of the leg and the length of the arm in one individual. And we can say absolutely that this species of Australopithecus, i.e. Australopithecus prometheus, had legs which were longer than the arms. In other words, like us, we have long legs and shorter arms. The apes, on the, on the contrary, have long arms and short legs. And there's been a lot of speculation in the past, and some people have claimed that Australopithecus had long arms and short legs. That is certainly not the case with Australopithecus prometheus. The proportions were similar to ourselves. We also know that she was walking upright. Uh, we know that from aspects of her foot and also from her pelvis. She was an upright walker with legs longer than arms. Um, there are, if you look at the hand there too, it's a complete hand. It's beautiful. It's the, the fingers and the thumb are folded over the palm. There's so much information to be gained just from that hand. The, the hand on this side, the right hand, there are some elements that are missing. Uh, there are certain elements of the arm that are missing. There are parts of the pelvis that are missing. And in fact, the, the bone that is preserved on that side is thinner than paper. It's just a skin of bone on top of rock. And the reason for this is the conditions within the cave. And this is why also it was so important that we excavate this slowly. Because by doing so, we've been able to interpret what we call the taphonomic history, the history of what happened to the body when it fell into the cave and the events that occurred in subsequent years. And there were many events. And these I will be recounting in the paper I'll be producing. Um, but it wasn't just one burial event. There was, there was burial and there was uh, slipping and there was collapse and there was re-cementation and there was decalcification. There were many events. And part of the decalcification or erosion of the breccia around the pelvis removed some of it. And unfortunately, we will never uh, recover that. It was, it was turned into pulp and washed away millions of years ago. But some of the missing elements, like the patelli, the kneecaps, probably floated away in water. And we may yet find them at a lower level within the deposit. Um, so we're very excited about the prospect of continuing the work in the cave and perhaps uncovering some of these missing elements. Uh, the foot bones, you'll see some of the foot bones are missing on this side and more on, on the left as well. Those were blasted off by the lime miners and despite our continuing efforts to, to locate them, we have been unable to do so. Um, it's possible that they were taken away years ago by souvenir hunters because we do know 
that uh, tourists were coming into the cave and taking away blocks of breccia uh, with fossils in them as souvenirs. That, of course, is forbidden now. You're not allowed to pick up fossils on any of these sites. But in the early days, uh, that was normal for people just to take things away. So, very, very exciting. Uh, very exciting, not only for us here in South Africa and here at Wits University, but exciting for the whole world. And once again, I want to thank PAST for enabling this, enabling us to bring this to your attention today. Littlefoot was the name that Philip Tobias applied to the first four foot bones. When I showed them to him, when I, when I first found them, he said, oh, what a little foot. Ha, ha, ha. Let's call it Littlefoot to contrast it with Bigfoot, the Sasquatch of North America. Um, and so when I found the, the rest of it, uh, beginning with the, the shin bone, there's, there's the fragment fitted on there, you see. Uh, when I found that and then the rest of the skeleton, it just became known as Littlefoot. Uh, well, she was, she was little, she wasn't, uh, and her foot was little. <laughs> uh, this is, of course, the culmina culminating find of my career uh, in terms of, of the greatness of the, of the specimen. Um, but who knows? That we may find even more complete ones in those caves. Uh, this was a rare occurrence. Uh, and the rarity of uh, finding uh, skeletons has to be appreciated. Normally, normally we're lucky if we find even part of a skeleton. The, the idea of finding a complete one may have been okay to Robert Broom in the 1930s, but as we proceeded with our researches in different parts of Africa, we realized that the chances were remote indeed, because when these animals or, or hominids died out in the open, they were quickly consumed by scavengers and the bones were scattered. So the only way that Littlefoot was preserved as a complete body is because she fell into the cave and was buried in sediment, by naturally buried in sediment, before any scavengers could get to her. And also it was in a very deep part of the cave and although we do find the fossils of many other uh, carnivores in there, we find hyenas, we find leopards, in fact a leopard mandible was found quite close to her, um, and we find saber-toothed cats, those are animals which also fell in, and they probably died in the fall. How deep? Um, how deep? Probably uh, more than 10 metres below the surface. Uh, she was elderly. Her teeth are extremely well-worn. Uh, particularly in the front. Um, I've been able to clean some of the teeth. I don't know if you can see from that side, maybe you can see the teeth. They're quite well worn. So she was fully adult. Um, and what made her fall into the cave, we don't know. Um, it could have been just, just an accident that she... We know that the area is full of holes surrounded by bushes and she may have just fallen in. But if that was the case, why didn't others also fall in over the millennia? She is the only Australopithecus that's ever been found in that cavern, despite the fact that there are thousands of bones of other animals. And we didn't find even a single tooth of another individual. So it's a very, very strange occurrence. I, I, I may have missed the beginning where you made the distinction between um, you referred to this specimen as Australopithecus prometheus, prometheus yes. as opposed to Australopithecus, the normal version. Africanus. Right. Africanus. I, I, I'm sorry for putting the normative on that, but what's the distinction? Ah, good question. Um, we're only really able to tell this now because of finding many other fossils um, of, of Australopithecus at Sturtfontein. Now, originally, Raymond Dart named Australopithecus Prometheus on the basis of an occipital that he said was so different from the Sturtfontein hominid, uh, particularly Mrs. Plez, uh, that he would make it a new species. Now, he could have been wrong, but history has shown that he was correct, because 
we did uncover more fossils at Sturtfontein in the 1980s that confirmed, in my view anyway, confirmed that Dart was correct in recognizing, recognizing a second species. And, and that second species differed from Africanus in having larger molar and premolar teeth and having low bulbous cusps on the teeth. Furthermore, it had a gap between the incisors and the canine. And you can see it in this one. It's a big gap there that's called a diastema. You get that in the apes. You get it in Australopithecus afarensis in East Africa, but you do not get it in Australopithecus africanus. Another difference that we can see now that we've got the complete skull here is that the face is longer and larger uh, than that of Australopithecus africanus. And there are, there are many other differences as well. Have any scientific publications been published on the description of this fossil or yet? Uh, only preliminary, only preliminary uh, accounts have come out as bits and pieces have been found. For example, I did one talking about the arm, but not a detailed uh, scientific analysis and description. That is happening only now. Because before we could do that, we had to get the material out of the rock and reconstruct it. You, you can't describe a fossil until you can see it. And um, as I mentioned earlier on, the first adult that Robert Broom found in 1936 is still in its crushed condition in the rock in the Transvaal Museum. And there are many other fossils like that, not only in the Transvaal Museum, but here in, behind us there are fossils that still require cleaning and reconstruction before they can be thoroughly analyzed and published. Um, certainly you can make basic observations, but to do a detailed analysis, you have to clean it, reconstruct it, and now, of course, CT scan it, so, um, so it's possible to see the internal anatomy as well.